Reporting for Heart Rhythm TV, I'm Meg Dandi, and I'm joined by Dr. Vivek Reddy from ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and we're going to be talking about the ADVENT trial sub-analysis that was presented at one of our late-breaking clinical trials sessions here at HRS 2024. Dr. Reddy, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. So right off the bat, uh, could you summarize some of the results of the ADVENT study and, and uh, help our viewers understand what the clinical implications of that are? Sure. Um, as you know, and now it's been published, um, the ADVENT ADVENT trial looked at patients who had paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and randomized them to either pulse field ablation or thermal ablation, either RF or cryo. And the top line results were that the KM curves looked very similar and the success rates are similar. So PFA was not inferior to radiofrequency slash cryoablation. But what does that mean? What is exactly a success? Well, success in ADVENT, like every other trial we've had in our field, was based on a 30-second definition of AF or AT recurrence. So if you have anything that exceeds 30 seconds, that's a failure. But we know that that's a very arbitrary definition. It's really not rooted in physiology, it's rooted in practicality and the fact that since the first couple of trials used 30 second, that's been perpetuated over time. So it's something that none of us are particularly happy with and we're trying to break out of it. So it's in that context that we conducted the sub-analysis of ADVENT. And we had two questions. The first question was to say, well, could we find a cutoff, not necessarily a, a, the duration of this, but rather a burden cutoff where, where you can say, you know, at this particular burden, once you exceed it, patients start feeling worse, they start using the healthcare re resources such as hospitalization and ER visits, et cetera. That was our first goal. Then the second goal is to say, okay, if that's the cutoff, then that's how we should define success slash failure. So then using that cutoff, let's try to look at how did pulse field do versus thermal ablation. And this is not you know, completely new. There's been a number of interesting publications recently that indicated that burden seems to be much more important in predicting these kind of outcomes. Okay, so in that context, we took the aggregate data, so about 600 or so patients where we had um, Holter monitoring and event recorders, and what we found was that using a 0.1% cutoff, if we're less than 0.1%, very little symptoms, very little healthcare utilization. When you're exceeded, that's when it starts happening. So the 0.1% seems to be a good percent that's not arbitrary, but actually has some physiology and practicality behind it. Then we said, okay, let's use that as a definition of success slash failure, and let's look to see what the difference is, if there is a difference between the two groups. And lo and behold, there actually was a difference. So in the pulse field group, using this 0.1% as a success, there was an 82% success, versus with thermal, it was 75%. And that was statistically significant uh, difference between the two. Remember, we have about 600 patients or so. So um, I think this is um, pretty much the first time in a randomized trial that we've seen a difference between pulse field and thermal ablation. There are some important caveats, obviously. This was not a primary analysis. This was a post hoc secondary analysis. We also didn't have continuous monitoring, which would have been the ideal situation. We had intermittent monitoring. We used Holters and uh, intermittent transtelephonic monitors. And I think that one part, uh, we've we talked about it, there was a discussion during the session and, yeah. and you know whether ILRs are a better way to really measure burning because it is continuous monitoring. And now with the advent of wearables and other ways of continuous monitoring, I think yeah. that that could really help delineate the burden even more. Uh, one of the questions I have is for the first three month blanking period, in yeah. the past, we've traditionally just kind of completely ignored it. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad that, you know, as a field, we're moving more towards not the 30 second yeah. binary result, but more of a burden result. In addition to that, should we also be looking at that three month period? And should that be really cut down to eight weeks as we saw in the European guidelines? Yeah, I 100% uh, I agree with that. I think that's absolutely true. There have been a number of publications, as you're aware, using continuous monitoring that shows that, you know what, what happens in the first month probably doesn't really reflect what's gonna happen. But once you get to the second month, and certainly by the time you get to the third month, that is reality. So um, I like already coming down to two months. I think we'll probably eventually end up at one month. And it, built, it makes more sense when if we get away from this 30 second business. Because when you get away from 30 seconds and you focus more on burden, then it's not as critical if it happens to be six weeks or five weeks or four weeks, because you're looking at something, not just a, a single arbitrary time point that happens to be early. You're looking at what's happening over time. So I, I think these two things are gonna go hand in hand, actually. 
And I think when we think about healthcare utilization, mm -hmm. that also is a really nice outcome that was looked at in this trial because we have a lot of studies in AFib that look at quality of life and then sometimes we get the question of well how is that cost effective or how is it really impacting our healthcare system and so that 0.1% of burden yeah. impacting actual hospitalization healthcare utilization is is uh, a really good uh, result to have looked at in this study and we always get into this question of well in a fee for service model if someone's yeah. coming into the hospital you're making money but that first of all is not yeah. appropriate and also just because you're claiming uh, a certain charges doesn't mean that, that they're actually being yeah. paid. Yeah, and, and I, again, I, I just want to give credit to the circuit dose investigator because they're the first ones that really put, the, put a spotlight on this issue and they had implantable loop recorders and they had a lot of data. Um, so I think they sort of led the way and there were a few other um, investigators and studies that have looked at this. But I think that, yeah, I'm very happy we did this analysis and for your audience, uh, it's now being published in Jack, so hopefully uh, you can, people can read that. And I think as a field, as you said, we need to move away from this binary endpoint of 30 seconds. Absolutely wonderful. Congratulations, Dr. Reddy, and thank you for all your work and for joining us today. Thank you. And for more coverage for the late-breaking clinical trials exclusively on Heart Rhythm TV, follow us on YouTube and Twitter.